Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more Conversations. Today, we're back in the studio after almost two years. And to help us celebrate, Peter Duchin is with us. Peter is a guy who always lights up a room. As the premier society band leader and pianist of our time, he led a charmed life. He dated Audrey Hepburn and Kim Novak, accompanied Sinatra, played Truman Capote's fabled black and white ball, did the White House, and played the Maisonette at the St. Regis. Over the past two years, he struggled with two major health challenges, a devastating stroke which left his left hand paralyzed, and just as he was recovering his capacity, a bout with COVID which put him in the hospital for 47 days on a ventilator. While many of his friends gave him up for lost, Peter fought back, and we're grateful he is with us today. He has written a moving memoir of his extraordinary life called Face the Music, and he's here to tell us about it. We're pleased to welcome Peter Duchin to the program. Now, Thank you, Jim. Now, Peter, as a songwriter said, it's nice to have you back where you belong. Where you belong. <laughs> right, in the chair. Yep. <laughs> but where's the piano? No piano, but the piano is coming. The piano is coming. Oh, thank God. Okay, I'll wait for it. Now, uh, you wrote a memoir before. Now you've written another memoir. So well, tell us about this one, Face the Music. Well, it's kind of different. The, the first memoir uh, uh, was uh, really a memoir that I wrote to be a memoir, actually for my kids, so they'd know, you know, what was the truth and what wasn't. <clears throat> this is kind of different because it has to do with the two really unfortunate things, the stroke that you mentioned and the COVID bout. And it occurred to me that maybe my feelings about recovering from these things were something that might inspire other people to have them because when I was in the hospital with my stroke, I was on a floor that had a, um, a gym at the end of the floor and people came to do their, their physical therapy in the gym and whatnot. And I noticed that an awful lot of those people had kind of given up and they, they were just they were despondent because we, we were all in wheelchairs at that time, and we'd sort of all gather at the, at, in the morning in, in a phalanx of, of wheelchairs. We'd be looking at each other, and half the people were just so sad. And of course, it's no fun being in a wheelchair, but I mean, they were so sad. I, it occurred to me you could do something for these people to make them feel, damn it, you know, I could, if I really worked on this, which is no fun, things might be better in my life. So I started throwing balls at them <laughs> and stuff like that and doing wacko things. And people sort of woke up and people seemed to be receptive to that. So this book is Face of Music, is a book really about that in principle. Well, you write that uh, when you were flat on your back with a stroke, you had the stroke when, in, in 2020? Yeah, no, th 2013, yeah. 2013? Yeah. Oh, and, uh, all right, 2013, but you said when you were flat on your back, Yeah. Uh, you th there were two things that really helped you. One was music, you listened to music. Absolutely. And the other is you thought a lot about your life and, uh, and your parents. Oh, I'd say what you now, your parents were both very well known, so uh, why don't you tell us something about them? Well, that was a very odd thing. The stroke gave me a totally different look at quite of the things, quite many of the things in my past. My mother died when I was born, so I didn't know her. That was in 1937. 37. Well, Actually, I am that old. <laughs> no, me too. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. And uh, uh, my dad died when I was 12. Dad was a very famous pianist called Eddie Duchin, and uh, about whom there was that movie and whatnot. The Eddie Duchin story. Eddie Duchin story, played by uh, Tyrone Power, a very famous actor at the time. thing I kind of liked was my mother was played by Kim Novak. Um, 
so one had definite, adequate, adequate feelings about her. And he, I met her in a funny way. I was at Yale when they made the movie, and I said to the guys, uh, friends of mine, you guys want to meet Kim Novak? I said, oh, you couldn't. They said, sure. We jumped in the car, a bunch of us, went down to Central Park where they were filming, and uh, I noticed that Kim was underneath a tr standing under a tree, being made up. Somebody was, you know, doing that. And so I walked up in back of her, and I put my arms around her, and gave her a kiss on the neck, and said, "Hi, mom." And she looked at me and said, "Oh, for Christ's sake," or something like that. Well, <laughs> that's how to meet your mother again. Well. When I got out of the hospital, I had all these photographs around me that I'd put wherever I was, you know, and there were photographs of dad, of my mother, dad and different people. And they had, just to me, they'd been like wonderful objects, wonderful background. They reminded me of things, whatnot. But I had never really, uh, really analyze what they really meant to me and what they meant to to my life, not having them there and not having known them. I mean, my mother, I could walk down the street, a passer, and I wouldn't recognize her. She wouldn't recognize me, her son, because obviously she died when I was born. So the deal being, I had the stroke, I, as you said, was lying on my bed, and I looked at these photographs, and I said to myself, what is going on there? What were they really like? What was dad really like? What, what would have happened if he had been with his band playing at the Waldorf Astoria, and with my band, I was playing at the St. Regis? I mean, how cool would that be? And uh, would he have liked the way I played? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one of the things that I wrote the second book about, because the first book I just sort of categorized things. The second book I tried to dig trenches. <laughs> you went much more deeply into yeah, it. Yeah. Well, your mother was a great beauty. She was photographed by uh, Cecil Beaton, an yeah. iconic photographer. And uh, she came from a, a very social, wealthy kind of background. And your father came from a very different kind of background. Why don't you talk a little bit about his background? Well, uh, my mother came from, as you say, a wealthy background that had spent all their wealth by the time she came. That often happens. Unfortunately, <laughs> bad timing. And uh, so she, her name was Ulrichs, and her family had built this big mansion in Newport and all that stuff. But my mother worked, which was unheard of for a person from that background in those days. My father came from a, well, a background of his father was a tailor, and uh, dad went to the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and uh, was driven every, maybe twice a week, I was told, by his mom into Boston, he lived in Cambridge, to a piano lesson. And he took the piano seriously and played for bar mitzvahs and this and that. He was Jewish. He was Jewish. And he played for bar mitzvahs and all that kind of stuff uh, around. And then he got to be rather good on the piano. And so he came into New York looking for work. And he got work at a fantastic place called the Central Park Casino, which has been torn down since. Probably for good reason. <laughs> um, yeah, well, Jimmy Walker <laughs> um, um, really did the Central Park Casino, which is the most glamorous restaurant. It was the most amazing restaurant, dan dance place, dancing, dining. And uh, the thing that he, <laughs> that he did with this great building in Central Park was he had an upstairs where he, so uh, entertained his lovers and of dispense, whom there were many of whom there were many and dispensed patronage 
of which there was quite a lot, and because, as you know, Jimmy Walker was got in some trouble. Uh, so my dad became the star there, became the band leader there. Well, Jimmy Walker was a mayor. He was probably a corrupt mayor. He uh, was a songwriter. He wrote his most famous song, Will You Love Me in September, you as you did in May. That was his uh, one song, I believe. One song that survived. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, you followed in your father's footsteps, uh, being a, a pianist and a band leader. Your styles might be, some might say, were similar. Some might say were quite different. Uh, and it'd be interesting to contrast them. Uh, but uh, your father uh, uh, shared another attribute with you, uh, which is a penchant for very beautiful women whom he liked to escort. I don't know and what you're talking about. Well, so, you may because you have this wonderful story in the book of the woman who came over to you at uh, the St. Regis and introduced herself and said, I knew your father. And well, then when not... you looked up, what did she say? Well, she, she was <laughs> leaning on the piano and said, you know, I knew your father. I said, well, that's nice. And then she said, no, I, I really knew your father. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm playing the piano. What am I supposed to say? How was he or something like that? Another th of those things was um, we played for the 100th anniversary, the 100th mystery guest at Love Boat, who turned out to be Lana Turner. And that was a big party that was given by the Love Boat people. At, in California, and the room was filled with people who had been on Love Boat, older actors, younger actors, old people, etc. It was amazing. The band on the way to the bandstand would say, oh my God, Cesar Romero, he's still alive, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And I'm going up to the bandstand, and I hear a, a lady's voice say, uh, oh, Peter, and I look over, and somebody who looked vaguely familiar was in a booth, and she said, could I talk to you? <laughs> and I said, sure. And I walked over, and she said, oh, I'm Dorothy L'Amour, and I just wanted to tell you, I really knew your father very well. We spent several weekends that were very interesting. I said, oh, Miss L'Amour, that is so good to hear. Uh, how was he? <laughs> And she said, N not there, not going to tell you that. Not going to tell. Well, yeah. all right, but you had a date when you were in college, I think, with uh, Audrey Hepburn. Not a date. Um, I, uh, I was her escort. That put it, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't like, hey, babe, let's go out to dinner. I was her escort to go take her to the opera or the theater. The opera was the opera. And... Uh, well, she's a, she was a terrific gal. I mean, she is wonderful. I liked her a lot. Yeah. It, it did, did not go anywhere. You didn't try to date her again. Uh, well, I thought she was a little old for me, a little thin. For me. <laughs> but a really nice, a clever, very, very smart woman. Okay, now you mentioned Kim Novak and uh, your um, uh, acting mother, uh, and did you take her out? Uh, yeah, I did take, I took her out for a while because after all, you had to do something for your mother. Yes, of I, course. I felt, you know, Oedipal and all that. She was beautiful, terrific girl. And she still lives and she's very, very interested in animals and animal, you know, saving animals and whatnot. She's a really nice lady. So is there anything you want to tell us about you and Kim Novak? Uh, no, I can't remember. <laughs> You're like Dorothy L'Amour. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember anything particularly. Oh, nothing stands out. No. Oh, well. And uh, then, uh, I think in the book, you uh, talk about an encounter you had with Marilyn Monroe. Oh, well, one of my dad's great friends was Toot Shore. And Turt Shore was a restaurateur who had a restaurant on 51st Street, and he was a great friend of my father's. Turt Shore was a character, a large, big, big man who enjoyed his cognac, <laughs> and most of the most of the long the day he would be drinking and having a good time. 
He loved sports and knew everybody in sports because you'd walk into his restaurant, you'd see perhaps Joe DiMaggio over there and you'd see Leo DeRocher over there and then you'd see other people like Chief Justice Warren in the <laughs> other place. I mean, it was a wild play, great play. As a matter of fact, <laughs> Toots and Jackie Gleason were good friends and they're both huge men. And they had a bet once while well, they'd been drinking since about 11 o'clock in the morning. And it was about four in the afternoon, so they were sort of well on the way. And the, their bet was that they would go out the front of Toots's restaurant, and Toots would go left around the block, and Gleason would go right around the block. And they bet on who would win get back to the front of the restaurant. Who did win? Well, I'll tell you, it's, it's, <laughs> they got a guy from the bar, from the <laughs> bar who was obviously, um, you know, a hood, who had a gun, and so he started off the race by shooting the gun in the, <laughs> in the air. And your market said go. Yeah, and they both did exactly the same thing. They ran up to the corner, and once they got to the corner, they turned around and turned around. They didn't keep running. They're supposed to keep running. So then they run back, and they they came right in f in front of each other, and they both sat down on the curb. There's a famous photograph of the two of them like this on the curb. A dead heat. Dead heat. A yeah. dead heat. So anyway, you ducked the question about Marilyn Monroe. Well, oh, she. <laughs> well, I was going to Toots's apartment to uh, uh, meet him because he was going to take me to a ball game. And uh, I sat down having a cup of coffee, waiting for him to come in. And all of a sudden, down the stairs of the apartment, I saw a woman in a kind of a negligee type of thing, little bathrobe. And she came down the stairs in a rather unusual way. I mean, <laughs> very enticing way. And it was Marilyn Monroe. And she came over and introduced us. I thought it was a, you know, I was in heaven. Were and you cool? I was cool. <laughs> I, 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 gee, I, oh, Miss Monroe and all that stuff. And she was there because Damasio was a great friend of Toots and they were getting a divorce. And so Toots put up Marilyn during the, the divorce. And uh, she, was lovely. She really was lovely. Did you ever meet her? I never met her. Did you date Marilyn? No, God, no. I wish I had. But you had one encounter with her. I, I, I would say that, well, I met her several other times, but no, I never took her. I, I think the Kennedys would have gotten in the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you knew the Kennedys. Uh, Jackie Kennedy was. Well, I knew knew all. And you knew I all of them. For Bobby, and you worked for Bobby. Sure. So uh, you were you were close to them as well. Um, so uh, talk about some of the gigs you had uh, with your band. Um, I know you played the White House. You had other memorable gigs. Oh sure. Well, there were a lot. Well, I mean, I played. I played pretty much, much, everywhere in Europe, and here. And uh, it's, uh, we've been all over. I would say, to say the best gig, I guess that's what you want, the best gig I ever had. I, I was in the office and there were, a call came in and it was a lady who from Chicago, who I didn't know, who said, would you be interested in paying for our 50th anniversary? And I said, sure. And we agreed on a price. She said, I want you to play at the Palmer House, start at seven o'clock, blah, blah, blah. I'd like, you know, a 10 piece band, please. So we agreed to, on all that. So we fly out, the band, we fly out to uh, Chicago. And I'd say around four in the afternoon, I go downstairs to help the band um, set up. So we're setting up, and I see that we're in the small ballroom, not not the regular ballroom, but a little a little ballroom off to the side. I was thought that was a little curious, perhaps, and then took a nap, 
came down just before seven, went into this, this smaller ballroom where we had to sort of scooch in the corner with the band, and there was only one table there, and a table and a dance floor. And I thought, God, they, maybe they're having drinks in here or something. And at exactly seven o'clock, this gorgeous, beautifully dressed woman walks in with her husband, white tie and tails, and they walk in the room and walk over to the piano. And she's got jewels all up, she's wonderful. And she walks over to me and said, Mr. Duchin, I just want to tell you that my husband and I, I'm so glad you could come. We actually uh, have this anniversary, as you know. We know many people have many friends, but we decided that what we wanted to do on our 50th anniversary was have dinner alone with you playing music that we could dance to between courses. And I said, you're kidding. Nobody's coming. She said, no, no guests at all. I hope you won't get bored. I said, are you kidding? This is, this is heaven. And she said, I hope the band doesn't fall asleep. And I said, they won't, I promise. So they had a five course meal uh, waiters serving them, champagne, the whole deal. They danced between courses, and at 12 o'clock on the nose, they both get up and come over to me, and she says, Mr. Duchin, it's the best day of our lives. Thank you so much. And that is the best party I ever played for. Very romantic. And who were they? I, I, I don't know. I didn't know them. Don't know them, never seen them. And you same. don't remember the name? No. Well, that was an enchanted evening. Oh, it sure was. And that's marvelous. Because it's a hell of a lot. I mean, I played a lot of parties at the White House, and I mean, parties where Lyndon Johnson, uh, you know, held up his grandson <laughs> on the piano or something. It was very funny. Or Johnson went in back of the bandstand to thank the band. And one of the trumpet players turned around because he'd done this to the trumpet player, turned around and found, found that he was playing its horn right in the face of the president of the United States, which <laughs> is a little, a little weird. So, uh, no, we, we had a lot of weird things happen at the White House. Maybe the <laughs> weird, weird, weird things always happen at the White House. Uh, no <laughs> kidding. I wonder, anyway, uh, I just uh, want to talk a little bit about your illnesses. Uh, your stroke left you uh, with the loss of the use of your left hand. And what it, what it did is it it shattered the 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 relationship of the left hand to the to my brain. So in other words, my right hand plays the piano. And By the, the way, my, the left hand plays the chords. Left hand can't play the chords. I wish it could. I have a guitar player who plays the <laughs> chords. The left hand just sort of goes down and doesn't do what I know it, I want it to do or what the hand has done for years. So the band says I sound better than ever. And I, They're I, being facetious. Not at all. <laughs> the, I, say, but, but I, I say, but I didn't use my left hand. They said it's exactly what we mean. No. Okay, so then 2020, COVID strikes. Oh, yeah. And that's 47 days in the hospital on... on, on no, I was about a lot longer in the hospital, 47 days... On the ventilator. On the ventilator. Oh, And Peter. that was... I don't remember anything about that. And now, did that affect your faculties at all after you I recovered from that? my memory, certainly. And I think my... I think my voice at times. And I think... Um, I think it made my, the COVID, my left side, which had been affected by the, the uh, brain damage of the stroke, my left side is decidedly worse. My left leg, I don't walk as well and all that kind of stuff. I walk with a cane, walk with walker. But you're still 
doing physical therapy to try oh, to yeah. regain I have fabulous. a couple of, of sadists that I'm very... You work with sadists, they help abs you. Absolutely. And, uh, but uh, Peter, what a triumph of the human spirit. I mean, it's just, uh, it's oh, marvelous Jim, to, Jim, to you hear either, you. Jim, either do it or you don't. Well, you did it. Well, uh, so I have a question to ask you. Uh, you wrote a book called, marvelous book called Face the Music. You certainly have faced the music, faced it twice. Uh, and uh, what's on the other side? Well, who knows? <laughs> Face the music and dance. That's <laughs> on the other side is dancing. I'll tell you what I want to be on the other side is to be able to walk without the use of a cane. That would be the best gift. Well, that's the next step. Yep. So keep fighting, Peter, and uh, Shall do. We, all, we all love you. Oh, thanks and, so much, John. And thank you for coming by. My and, pleasure. And well, thank you for coming by. Uh, tune in uh, next week for more conversations. This one has just been marvelous. Uh, and uh, I'm Jim Zirin. Take care. Be well. And um, keep your distance. Wear a mask when necessary. Certainly get vaccinated. And um, all the best.